We're going to start this new year with a program on the environment. Every summer we read that Colorado's front range has ozone pollution levels that exceed national air quality standards. Part of it's our hot, dry climate that creates conditions for ground level ozone to form. But it's also our activities, emissions from cars and trucks, oil and gas drilling, and industrial smokestacks that add to the problem. Then too, there is um, the ozone from, uh, from wildfire smoke, which in some summers, particularly two years ago, envelops us. In 2022, Denver was ranked the seventh most polluted city in the United States for ozone pollution. Here today to explain why ozone pollution is a problem along the Front Range and what is being done about it is Boulder's very own Casey Becker, who now serves as regional administrator for EPA's Region 8 office. In that role, Casey oversees EPA's efforts um, in a region that includes Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. You all know Casey. She spent uh, four years on our city council and served four terms in the Colorado House two years as majority leader, and two years as the Speaker of the House. We're thrilled that Casey could be with us today. Please welcome Casey Becker. Hi, everyone. It is so good to be back at the Boulder Rotary. I don't think I've been here since I started as a legislator, um, but I came a few times when I was a city council member, too, and it's it's a, it's a delight to be here. And um, as David mentioned, I'm now, I was appointed by the president to oversee EPA for a six state region. And um, I am a lawyer and now I oversee all these scientists and engineers and I'm learning the language. <laughs> um, but uh, some of the stuff that I'm gonna go over is really technical. And so I'll do my best to, um, <clears throat> They have to dumb it down for me and I'll try and keep it really simple because we're talking about the Clean Air Act, we're talking about ozone pollution. Who, who ever thought of these things 10, 20 years ago? Um, it was, it's really been um, because Colorado um, air quality is getting worse and worse or it's our air quality problem is, is very persistent, I should say. Um, and then with a lot more awareness of climate change, some of these concerns about air quality um, are, are really becoming more front and center. And I, I welcome that. I think that's good to grow awareness about these things. So David asked me to talk about um, ozone because it is in the news in Colorado all the time. Um, so I'm going to talk about ozone. I'm gonna talk a little bit about climate change and the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, which Congress passed um, last year and the year before. Um, I'm gonna talk about how Colorado is uh, um, addressing air quality. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm gonna start out just mentioning when, when I was appointed to this position um, with this administration, the, the very first two things the administration did is change the priorities for EPA. And the first thing we did is said, climate change has to be, addressing the climate crisis really has to be the number one priority. And number two is really looking at our environmental problems through an environmental justice lens. And what that means is really looking at the communities who are most impacted by pollution and thinking of them first. So with that in mind, um, Congress, Gosh, when I was in the legislature, we kind of, you know, we were the state legislature, but we would tease Congress all the time because they never got anything done. Well, the last couple years, they've gotten huge things done. The um, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act 
mean um, the biggest investments the United States has ever made broadly in infrastructure and um, more specifically in climate change. So just an overview of climate change, it affects everyone, but it does affect some um, communities more uh, acutely than others. And, um, and this investment that, the, um, it, that Congress made with the Inflation Reduction Act in the bipartisan infrastructure law um, for EPA means $100 billion in the next five years that we're um, investing in the United States in a variety of ways. New technologies, um, improving water infrastructure, replacing dirty school buses with clean buses. It's really an unprecedented level of investment that we're we are making in the long-term health and sustainability of our communities and of our planet. So normally, EPA's budget is about $10 billion a year. I just mentioned we, are, we now have $100 billion additional over five years. So one of the things I've been doing in this role is actually um, <clears throat> trying to implement those laws, hiring a lot of people to get that money out the door. Um, and um, it's, it's a really exciting, but a very busy time for us. Uh, can I ask you a favor? Can you hand me my glasses? <laughs> okay, they, ha they have this little monitor here and I realize I can't see that and I can't see that. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna get into just a little bit about the, the specific topic for the day, which is ozone. And if you read the Denver Post, the Colorado Sun, the Daily Camera, you will see um, ozone in the paper all the time and our air quality challenges in Colorado all the time. And so I've listed here the, the six um, pollutants that EPA regulates with national ambient air quality standards, but, and the one that we're really gonna focus on here is ozone. And what is ozone exactly? Um, oh, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, here we go. Um, so ozone is a gas that um, you hear about the ozone layer. That's good ozone. That's six miles to 30 miles up in the atmosphere. We want that ozone. That's good. What we don't want, what we're talking about today, is ground level ozone. Um, ozone that um, when certain pollutants, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, interact with sunlight and heat, it creates pollution. And that pollution impacts us. It impacts asthma, lung capacity, um, your ability to breathe, um, anything just um, having to do with, with, with breathing. I mean, it kind of matters, right? Um, so, so the bad level is what, but the bad ozone is what occurs at ground level and it's a harmful pollutant. And it's really, when you think of smog, that's ozone. And EPA regulates that. So when, when cars or oil and gas, power plants, things like that, all those emissions interact with, with heat, um, it, it creates pollution. And it's especially a problem here in Colorado because our geography locks in a lot of that air. We get these inversions and all that dirty air stays at the ground level and impacts how we breathe. And it also really matters because Colorado, Coloradans care about air quality. We, a lot of us moved here because we want to, you know, play outside a lot and we really appreciate the mountain vistas and the opportunities um, that the beautiful environment we have here really affords. Um, so that's what we're talking about today. So Colorado is um, the front range of Colorado that's highlighted right there. If you can't tell, that's Jefferson County, Denver, Broomfield, Adams, Boulder, and parts of Larimer and Weld counties. So the most um, populated part of the state lives there, and that's where Colorado is in what's called severe non-attainment. It means EPA has said, this is one of the most polluted areas for air quality, for ozone in particular, in the nation. Um, and um, so Colorado has to put together, uh, whoops, 
this is um, a, a plan to deal with this ozone. And you can see um, in 2008, um, EPA said you have to be at 75 parts per billion. Um, that's when we were about at 82 parts per billion. And then um, in 2015, we lowered the standard. And that's just recognition that as science develops, we realize that we need to have even a lower amount of ozone um, for human health. And so Colorado is way above it. You can see we are generally around 80 parts per billion. So what happens is Colorado puts together a SIP, what's called a state implementation plan. There's a lot of information there. But the consequences for the state are really high if they don't start addressing ozone. And what happens is they lose all their transportation funding and they aren't allowed to build new transportation projects. That's the big piece. And then it means Colorado, um, EPA will come in and take over the state's air um, plan. So the consequences are high, but the real consequences are the ones that are um, for human health. And ozone is a greenhouse gas precursor, and the other greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change also contribute to ozone. So the real issues here are the problems that it creates for climate change, and then ultimately the problems that it's going to create for the state. Um, if, if they don't get it under control. So the one thing that um, works, um, that where Colorado is sort of doing better is we are not impacting downwind states, but upwind states are impacting us. This map is a little complicated. All it is is to show that um, California, Nevada, and Utah um, are now having to come up with a plan to um, address their ozone impacts because all those winds come to us and affect our air quality. I'll tell you, um, Utah is not very happy about this. They've sued us. <laughs> um, and the US Supreme Court just said they're gonna take up this case um, to determine if EPA's rulings on the interstate transport rule, the good neighbor plan, um, they're called the same thing, are um, legitimate. So, so there's arguments in February as the US Supreme Court considers whether EPA is allowed to tell certain states that they can't um, impact downwind states. Um, so this is all um, a little too technical, but I just wanted to, what it shows is that a lot of the ozone that um, we're dealing with does come from out of state. Um, a lot of it is naturally occurring. And so Colorado itself is really limited in what it can do. So what is it doing? Um, the options that Colorado has to really address ozone are um, a, a, to address the sources of, of ozone, which are volatile organic compounds. That's trucks, cars, power plants, industrial sources, things like that. So the um, lawn and garden equipment, believe it or not, that's something that they're looking at right now. Anything that, when it combusts, it releases a gas, is collectively impacting your and my health. What can you do? You can um, switch to an electric vehicle. You can take a bus more often. You can um, switch to an electric um, lawn or garden equipment. Um, and then also the oil and gas that is along the Front Range and in Weld County has a big impact. But this lists some of the things that EPA is doing. So I mentioned the bipartisan infrastructure law um, one of my favorite things that Congress has told us to do, um, they gave us $5 billion to replace dirty school buses with electric school buses. Um, it's amazing. School buses are expensive. They're about $400,000 for an electric school bus. $5 billion doesn't go that far. Um, but Colorado's um, on the forefront of applying for this money and switching over to clean school buses. Then I also mentioned it also lists there um, grants um, for solar. So Congress gave EPA $7 billion to, uh, in a project that's called Solar for All. It's just getting rolled out, but the idea is really to make solar investments um, in, in disadvantaged and low-income communities. So I think that's really exciting. And then um, we, we're giving out a lot of money to states um, for pollution reduction grants, water quality grants, 
and things like that. So we have what I call the carrots and sticks, the investments, all these that we're making and giving to states and local governments. And then there's a lot that we're doing on the regulatory side. Um, here it mentions, we just passed a methane reduction rule um, and Occidental Petroleum just announced today that they're actually in support of the rule, which is great, because when you have oil and gas companies saying, we recognize that methane releases from oil and gas has a human health impact and we're gonna do our part to address it, I think that's, that's success. Um, the Regional Hayes Program, that's an effort to limit the pollution that affects national parks. As we do that, it will have a, um, it will also affect the pollution that's causing climate change. Um, Congress, um, in phasing out hydrofluorocarbons, I can never say that, HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, um, actually approved a, an international treaty to um, agree to reductions in HFCs. So it was bipartisan. I think that's another great um, uh, achievement that this last Congress has made because they are doing their part as um, to uh, to reduce the impacts of climate change and ozone. Um, and then states are um, developing their own climate adaptation plans. So the other thing I just want to mention is um, EPA under this administration along with about 20 other federal agencies um, joined a national climate task force um, and these are the goals that we're working towards. Um, so all of this is to say that you read about ozone every day, the, all the time in the paper and how Colorado's in severe non-attainment for ozone. You read about climate change all the time. Um, these things have real human health impacts. Um, there's a lot that Congress has done and EPA is doing to address those um, and to really, um, localize it for you. I think the, the perspective of ozone, which again is a reflection of the climate change that's happening, you know, as, climate, as the climate warms, ozone gets worse, um, and, and we in the Front Range are hugely impacted by that. Um, the, the, it, it shows that all of these things are tied together. The oil and gas production that's happening locally, um, the way that our climate in Colorado specifically works, at the end of the day, impacts your ability to um, breathe fresh air. And, and so Colorado uh, is, is working diligently to come up with a plan. And it's not easy, all the low-hanging fruit to address climate change or to address ozone is, is really gone. And they're looking at these things like like I said, switching lawn and garden equipment to electric, switching, getting, incentivizing people to use electric cars, um, putting a lot more controls on the methane releases at oil and gas on the front range. Um, none of it is easy. And I have to say that, oh, that's not my last slide. I should have um, realized these were here. So, um, so like I said, reducing vehicle greenhouse gas emissions is another thing that we're doing that Colorado is um, adapting, um, uh, trying to get cleaner cars out there and um, it, improving the emissions on passenger cars and trucks and then commercial cars and trucks. Um, and then as I mentioned, going through all the bill and IRA grants, Colorado is almost every state in the country decided um, to accept money from EPA to come up with climate pollution reduction plans. Colorado's one of them. And when they develop that plan, they'll apply for $4.6 billion in grants to address climate pollution. I think that's notable because 45 of 50 states are doing this. Not all 45 governors in the United States will even say the words climate change, but they're taking this money and developing plans to actually address climate impacts. I mentioned the Solar for All plan um, that's listed there. Um, we're also going to be putting a billion dollars in to competitive grants um, to switch heavy duty polluting diesel vehicles, um, switch them to clean um, electric vehicles. 
And then we've also, um, Congress set aside a billion dollars um, for largely states and oil and gas companies to um, incentivize them to reduce their methane. And then I mentioned clean school buses. That bus that's pictured there is a clean school bus. It looks just like a regular school bus, but it's quiet. It's completely quiet, and these bus drivers I've talked to said they love it because they can actually hear what's happening in the back of the bus. They also love it because where a tailpipe emits, um, uh, has tailpipe emissions, that's right about the height of like a kindergartner or a first grader, right? So they're just breathing a lot less dirty air. And that's it for me. So I hope that gives you a little context about um, the ozone problem in the Front Range, what Congress and what EPA are doing about it, and why it matters for your human health and how it affects climate change. So I am happy to take questions at this point. I know there was a lot of information on my slides. That goes back to having engineers and scientists work for me. And there's just, like, I'm constantly like, let's simplify that a little bit. They're all really, really smart. Thanks, Casey. <laughs> that was a great presentation. Um, Jerry Mock, question about EPA funding. Um, you mentioned competitive grants. So are each region in competition with the other regions, or is there a base level appropriation that you get annually and then competitive grants on top of that? Yeah, it really depends on the grant. And it's um, so much of what we're doing right now is making sure states and local governments and communities know about all these grant opportunities. Um, but it, it really depends, like on clean school buses, we were given, in my region, a certain amount of money. Um, we are one of the smaller regions from a population standpoint, um, but it just depends um, from grant to grant. And so, and some of them, uh, you know, certain states aren't interested in, and it, it just depends from grant to grant. But it's a great time to be a state government or local government because all this money is coming in, not just from EPA, but other federal agencies to invest in infrastructure um, and then to invest in climate. Yes. Thank you. Hey, KC. Um, I say this, this, ask this question with, with no conflict of interest. I retired from the Dell Energy Board last year. And um, my question is, how do you get involved between, say, Excel and interveners? And what I mean by that is um, Excel has been spending about $5 billion a year for the last eight years on transmission and moving to renewables. Um, there, when I joined the board in 2007, it was about 72% coal, and today it's about 18% coal. There are days in Colorado where it's between 56 and 80% of the energy generated is from renewables. As Excel tries to do more, what invariably happens at the PUC is interveners, in other words, people who are producing fossil fuels, come in and say, no, no, we shouldn't be moving to renewables so fast. And the reason that's obviously important is it slows down the efficacy of what you're talking about in terms of moving to you know, electric buses and cars. If the source of that energy is fossil fuel, you still have a problem. Not as much problem as if the, 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 uh, the vehicle is fossil fuel fueled as well. So how do you get involved? How can you get involved prospectively so that when Excel comes forward and it will continue to do that, asking for more renewable resources or the ability to spend on renewable resources. How do you keep the interveners at bay who are right now more interested in stopping that and continuing fracking and continuing to drill? Yeah, you know, EPA is a regulatory agency, so we regulate industries. We regulate um, through the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act and um, if, if if there's not a role for us in one of those contexts, we don't get involved. So, um, you know, other federal ag agencies regulate transmission of power. But what Tim is talking about is, um, you know, Colorado is actually moving, um, it was a law that I passed, <laughs> um, towards uh, um, really uh, moving away from all um, fossil fuels for in the energy sector. 
in, um, so Colorado expects all of their coal-fired power plants to close by, I think, 2030. And so they're replacing it all with, with wind, solar, hydro, um, battery, and, um, but, but we, the, the state certainly hears from other parties saying, you're doing it too quickly or you need to have a different balance. And we don't get involved as EPA in those conversations. Um, we're really looking at, are you allowed to emit that benzene, that, that um, those VOCs, though, you know, how, uh, that methane, the pollution that you're putting in the air, are you complying with the law as you pollute? And that's really what we do. So we do not weigh in, um, and I, on behalf of the administration, wouldn't weigh in on um, Colorado's specific plans to move away from fossil fuels. But it is one of those things that as it moves away, you know, they're going to, Colorado's doing its part to address climate change, Colorado doing its part to address some of these other um, pollution sources that I mentioned, you know, the impacts to particular particulate matter, ozone, things like that. Thank you, I have a much better understanding of Colorado. But I'd like to ask a question that's based upon something that you said at the beginning, that climate change affects people differently, and also you have a knowledge of how Washington works. So my question is this, from all the documentaries I've seen, the greatest impact of climate change is on very poor countries where um, the, uh, the land is being destroyed, uh, and, and, and it's driving migration, and, and both to our borders and to Europe, and, and it's going to get bigger and bigger. So to your knowledge, can you say anything about what the United States might be doing to, instead of just putting up border walls, to help people live financially and farm in their own countries. Yeah, so I think, I think it is true that climate imp imp impacts different places differently. And, um, and I think one of the points hopefully I made clear is climate change affects your health because it creates more pollution for things like ozone, particulate matter, things like that. It also is a, and I'm answering this, my stepmom always says, Casey, the climate's been changing forever. I don't know why you're worried. Thank you. She's from Louisiana. And, um, and it matters because it affects health. Um, it affects migration patterns, as you mentioned. And our infrastructure as a country was not built for a changing climate. The, my parents live in Florida. The seawall that they live next to, because they live on a river, was only built um, for, for surges of a certain size. And it's constantly flooding now. My dad is an orange grower and, um, and he had the biggest, the worst year in the history of our family growing oranges, which is about 60 years, um, last year because of the hurricanes. So, so the infrastructure that we have or the way that we've designed our lives is not built for a hotter environment. Um, so what you asked, what is the United States doing? And there are international agreements that I think we're making progress on. I think a lot of the work that we're doing right now, like the methane rule that we just passed, the investments that we're making is leading by example. If we as a country are saying, we are going to start um, requiring oil and gas to, to capture more methane instead of burning it off into the air, um, other oil producing countries are going to be pressured to adopt those similar technologies. So I think it's leading by example. I think it's um, working internationally um, to, to lead in, in that context to reach agreements about every country's role in our greenhouse gas you know, emissions efforts. Hello, thank you so much for speaking today. I have a question about what are some upcoming um, elections that are relevant to this issue um, that we can weigh in on and have a say in or, uh, yeah. So I am 
an appointee who's not allowed to talk about elections. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna leave that to you, but I will say elections matter um, a lot. And, um, you, you know, I think that more and more nationally, uh, you know, I, I operate in six states, and there isn't one of those states where they don't, at the staff level, say, we have to be yeah, considering climate change or we have to be doing something on climate. There's not a one of them. Now, maybe publicly they don't say that or maybe the governor doesn't say that. I will say that, um, you know, as an example in Wyoming, Governor Gordon, um, there, he is the head of the Western Governors Association, and his, he gets to decide the initiative of the year, and his initiative is, um, is advancing carbon sequestration. And what is that? You know, that's trying to get carbon out of the atmosphere by burying it, um, but that's Wyoming. And he is saying, we in Wyoming have to do our part to address um, the fact that there's too much carbon in the air, which is what's causing climate change. So um, I'm not gonna weigh in on specific elections, but I will say elections matter, and talking about the very real impacts of climate, the impacts of ozone, things like this, are um, one way that we can advance the conversation and normalize it and get other people on board of, because you know our planet and our health and our children all depend on a, um, addressing climate change. Early in your presentation, and thank you for being here, uh, you, you had, um, mentioned that Colorado needs to prepare a plan that is gonna be re re reviewed. Uh, a couple of questions. First of all, how long does Colorado have to get this plan together? And then will you, will the regional U EPA review that plan? And then it was interesting to me because if we don't, if the plan is not approved, then there's these punitive measures that come into play, which potentially could impact the availability of transportation kind of projects. Um, at a time when there's a lot of money now for transportation projects. So it seems to me like the, st the stakes are very high, and I'm just wondering how, how much time does Colorado have to get its act together? Yeah, so I really, um, I had some slides up on there, there but I skipped over it because it's really in the weeds. Um, but Colorado has to put a plan together that EPA approves or disapproves, and um, there are lots of sort of iterations of it, and, um, and they have to do it for you know, the 2008 standard and the 2015 standard. And so I feel like I'm constantly having new Colorado plans come to me for review. <laughs> and so it's really hard to keep track of, but, um, and recently we disapproved part of their plan and we approved part of their plan. Um, and you can, so there's lots of pieces to it. And so there's different sections that we might approve or disapprove. What I will say is Colorado's working earnestly to figure it out, that there are no easy answers. There are always trade-offs, right? There's always, if they are, um, you know, we need to get um, gas-powered vehicles off the road and big, you know, non-road engines becoming more efficient and, you know, capturing more methane um, from oil and gas wells. So they're working towards that. Um, when is the actual drop deadline? It, it can change because um, sometimes we might give extensions, sometimes we end up in court and courts decide. But it really is, it really is you know, to try and put a date on it in the next few years. Um, the pressure is on. Because, and that Clean Air Act, that was written in 1972, I believe. Um, so when Congress said, you know, if you don't meet these Clean Air Act obligations, you're gonna lose, you're not gonna be able to do transportation projects, you're gonna lose transportation funding. That was done a long time ago. Now we're really at the point in Colorado, it's like Colorado, or the Front Range, um, Dallas, Houston, LA, um, all those places are really at the, at the point where um, the rubber's hitting the road, so to speak. So in the next few years is really when we have to figure it out. And yes, those plans come to EPA, and it's, it's hard. <laughs> you, can, you can become very unpopular very fast. Hi there. Um, thanks, thanks for being here, and thank you for lending your 
talents and skills to these challenging issues and providing public service in, in Boulder at the state level and then the federal level. Thank you so much. A great example for the students. Many of us teach at CU. We'd love to have you speak with the students uh, sometime. But my question has to do with <clears throat> the coordinative aspects that you have, you face. So you alluded to a rule from a different agency, for example, and all the different states that are involved. And to what extent implementing this type of goal on climate change involves coordinating with other federal agencies and with other states? Yeah, so, you know, when, when Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, as I mentioned, it was the biggest investment ever in, in addressing climate. And it's going to have an ancillary benefit of, you know, creating a huge amount of jobs because we're doing solar for all, we're, um, we're creating a green bank, we're you know, uh, creating an incentive for new clean school buses, all these types of things. Um, each federal agency has a different piece in this. And so the housing and urban development got a billion dollars to retrofit buildings with clean, um, with, with better, uh, less emitting, you know, um, building materials and um, Department of Interior got money to invest in, in water infrastructure and um, you know so sort of all different federal agencies have a different role. One way we're coordinating is in a couple weeks all those federal agencies from US Department of Ag, EPA, HUD, Treasury we're all getting together Department of Energy and doing a, a seminar in Denver um, but the but the way the law was designed is is to co each agency sort of complements um, e each other. We each have a different role, um, so it was really well thought out in that regard. It, by the way, no one really expected it to pass, <laughs> and so all the dates were by the time it finally did pass were dates that had been written like a year or two before, and so we're like working really hard to get this money out really fast. It's just a little anomaly of how Congress works sometimes because when Joe Manchin from West Virginia finally said, okay, I'm gonna vote for this, they got it done really fast, didn't change the dates, and now we're rushing to get this money out and businesses are rushing to staff up to be able to apply for the money and, and put it to use. Um, but other than that little wrinkle, <laughs> Um, I think the federal agencies are doing really a great job of, of sort of funding a variety of pot projects not overlapping and then staying in touch with each other through the climate, um, the National Climate Task Force to, um, you know, to, to, to make sure that we're aware of the different technologies and coordinating them um, and providing very different incentives. So. Well, Casey, uh, at Rotary, we have a tradition that we get the last word. And our last word today is to honor you and the wonderful talk you gave and uh, how interesting and educational it is for all of us. And um, I know for my wife, Leslie, I want to honor also your something that fits in with Rotary really well, and that says we are bipartisan. And you've done that your entire career and the legislature, the General Assembly, and I'm sure you're also doing it with the EPA. And working with um, senators, like someone I've worked with, with Sustainable Israeli-Palestinian Projects, Kevin Priola, who was a Republican, of course, as you know, when you worked with him so well, and also your collaboration with Steve Finberg at the time. So I wanna honor that. I wanna say, Casey, keep up the good work. In your honor, we are donating 100 doses of polio vaccine to our Rotary Polio Plus campaign to finally, once and for all, get rid of this dread disease. So thank you, Casey. Thank you all for having me. It's a delight to be here. I didn't give you the last word. I Sorry. Um, and thanks for having an interest in, you know, climate and air quality and, and the health of everyone along the Front Range.
have exactly one weekend to read The Problem of Alzheimer's for the Boulder Rotary Book Club this Monday, January 8th from 5 to 6 p.m. at Jancy Campbell's house. The book addresses the scientific, historical, political, cultural, and social problems swirling around one of today's most prevalent illnesses. RSVP to Jerry Mock or Kathy Olivier. Go get the book. Start reading when you leave today's meeting, Monday, January 8th, 5 to 6 p.m. RSVP. The Boulder Rotary Update comes to you each week from Los Amigos, Mike Brady, Cassidy Murphy, Carl Kurtz, Janet Beardsley, Charlotte Rome, and Chad Stam. However, after three years, it's time for Mike Brady to step back. Would you like to join the team and help with the weekly announcements? It's a ton of fun and a great benefit to the club. Please talk to Mike Brady or Cassidy Murphy if you would like to help starting July 1st of this year. Are you looking for a free six-week program that will cover leadership in a new way? Well, Rotary District 5450 has just a thing for you. RISE, Rotarians Inspired to Succeed and Engage, is a great program starting on Saturday, February 10th, covering some of the key practices you see up on the screen. You will learn to be a better leader and learn to be a better leader within Rotary. For more information, talk to President Carl or read the most recent district newsletter. It's not too early to mark your calendar for the 2024 District 5450 Conference. Join Rotarians from 57 clubs in our district on Saturday, September 28, 2024 at the Colorado State University Spur Hydro Building in Denver. The focus of the program will be on Rotary's newest area of focus, the environment. Learn what Rotarians are doing on topics like sustainable living and agriculture, Rotary Firewise, Operation Pollination, and Pollution and Plastic Waste. Save the date, Saturday, September 28, 5,430 feet above sea level. Most of us don't notice any effect from it, but we may have visitors who get headaches or can't catch their breath. Altitude is something we often take for granted, but can still affect us in ways we may not recognize. BRC member and founder of Mountain Air Cardio, John Jonas, is coming next week to give, as he describes it, a nerdy talk about altitude, physiology, and some of the body's responses to hypoxia, that's altitude for the rest of us, also how to identify and mitigate the symptoms of acute mountain sickness at altitude. It's going to be an awesome program. Don't miss it. You know what I think we should do? I think we should all have a great weekend.